Hi guys, it's Cliff here from Down Under. Alright, so part 21 on rapid turn is about accuracy and uh, doing an actual practical test, a production run of about 40 parts um, to, see, to see whether in practice the errors would be as bad as I had anticipated in the theoretical test of video number 20. Um, and I found that they weren't as bad. So that's really good news. Unfortunately, I struck a, what I think is another issue with rapid turn um, during that production run. I seem to be really jinxed with rapid turn, um, which kind of distracted me from the main subject of the video, which is accuracy of rapid turn. And I ran the second half of the parts in my vertical spindle turning situation um, in order to get around this issue I was having. So anyway, that's just an introduction. I'll get on with it now. Uh, so yeah, I decided to run the parts on rapid turn. Um, it was nearly 40 parts, uh, on the first side anyway, and see how it went, because that's not so critical. And um, I found that the problems due to thermal expansion were less than I had anticipated. The diameter um, was, was maintained at about plus or minus one hundredth of a millimeter or if you like plus or minus half a thou so that's not high precision but it's sort of medium precision sort of general workshop precision um, um, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't really concentrate on trying to get the precision of the parts better than that because I had another issue another problem with rapid turn well at least I think it's rapid turn I seem to be really jinxed on rapid turn. I've, I've never seen this before, but intermittently, sometimes the part would face with a strange double spiral. I've, I've just put some uh, ink on it and polished off the ink at the high spots, and it's about a hundred mil, hundredth of a millimeter deep, or half a thou deep, strange double spiral. And it's on most of them to some degree. And I was so busy concentrating on trying to track down what was causing that and remove the problem that I couldn't really concentrate on the precision of the diameter. Um, but, you know, all the same, I've got an accuracy of about within half a thou, plus or minus half a thou, so within a thou on most of the parts. So that's okay, it's not fantastic, but for this type of part it's not too bad. Okay, well let's get underway on this run of parts. So um, this is the first operation is machining the back of the little billets of uh, 6061 aluminium and the diameter, the outside diameter. It's not highly critical, so it'll be a good test. Um, I've got a really f rapid uh, feed rate uh, to save time and also to utilize the chip breaker that I've ground in the top of the tool, um, that, apart from on the finishing cut so I don't get a big tangle up of swath and I can let the job run automatically while I do something else. So let's just run uh, one cycle now. It'll be a bit noisy so I won't bother trying to talk. Um, there's not a lot of power in rapid turn. This is only uh, a 60 millimeters 6061 aluminium and I've taken fairly aggressive cuts so that I could use the chip breaker in the end of the tool. It's got a little scallop ground in the end of the tool and it needs a high feed rate to turn the chips into short chips. Um, and that's on the point of stalling it. I could hear the motor slowing down um, as the tool wore and it got worse and worse and worse to the point where it actually stalled the motor and skidded the belt. So I now know that there's not a lot of power there. I suppose it's fairly demanding of horsepower, turning 60 millimeters diameter, one millimeter deep cuts. 
um, next time I do it I'll program half a millimeter deep cuts and just take a little bit longer because I really don't want to skid those belts again like that um, so you know power is a limiting factor um, the accuracy issue was not too bad I found that the headstock didn't warm up as much as it did during the tests and I could um, once it had settled in I could machine parts to within one or two hundredths on the diameter uh, if I tried really hard I might be able to get closer um, but I'm using the same tool for roughing and finishing and it's not too critical so I just pressed on a um, couple of details I think it's really important to have a little cover like this on your uh, indexing key otherwise that critical area in there is going to get full of chips and I really think you need a cover like this as well because this is getting not only splashed with coolant but splashed with covered in chips and that would get into the motor and the belt it can get in through here it could get into the end of the motor so you need something there as well um, that's all I can think of at the moment as a summary of this first multiple part metal turning production run so to cut a long story short I had this really weird horrible uh, surface finish when I was facing the parts um, about a hundred hundredth of a millimeter or half a thou deep coarse double spiral on most of the parts occasionally they came out really good um, because this finish is so even it has to be to do with the rapid turn um, software feeding the facing cut um, but I haven't got much further than that with it so what I did in the end was reset the job back up in my other 1100 and um, did it via started to cut the other side via vertical spindle turning and um, the same tool uh, with a, a little ground scalloped chip breaker in it cutting a perfect finish and giving much more accurate consistent diameter control as well doing spindle turning chip braking fine, running automatically, very accurate diameter control, no real problems doing it via spindle turning. And with hindsight I would have started the job with this. I know it sounds a bit depressing really, because I've got rapid turns sitting idle yet again. But until I get to the bottom of it, I don't want to say that this is an, an, an irresolvable problem. It could be just another hiccup along the way. I think this problem of the uh, strange spiral finish has got something to do with this. When you're conversationally programming, uh, the software uses G95 and G96. So, the, uh, for example, the feed rate is in units per revolution mode and the surface speed is, is linked in with that. So as you're facing and the diameter is re reducing, the RPM of the spindle needs to increase and there's an encoder on the spindle, the little sensor, which is sending a signal to the software and it needs to um, set and coordinate those different parameters. And what may be happening is, as it drifts slightly out of, out of pace, the software does a calculation and makes a correction and just slows down the feed rate for a little while until the encoder feedback system is, is corrected. And then it goes forward again at the pitch and then speeds up a little, slows down a little, just keeping uh, things on track, a little bit like thread cutting really. 
but we're doing it across a facing um, machining operation. And what what happens when you get, what may be happen, happening when you get a pause or hesitation and then an increase in the feed rate as it goes across the face is that the tool pressure and tool spring and you always get some tool pressure and tool spring um, allows it to dig in slightly when it slows down and to uh, flex away slightly when it speeds up and the fact that it's a very even pattern like that makes me think it must be uh, something to do with the feed rate uh, encoder feedback software circuit if you like that's going on um, how to correct that and still be able to use the conversational programming I'm not sure it's not unique to this particular part I noticed it when I was machining some parts the other day I had the same problem but it didn't matter it wasn't a critical surface finished job so it didn't really register what it was I was too busy concentrating on other issues so uh, anyway that's just my early thoughts but I haven't had time to really thoroughly investigate it because um, I've just got this other urgent work on and I've had to set up my spindle turning and get that underway well, this is a part I was making the other day and you can just see it there again this is with a boring tool um, so a completely different settings but again you can see that strange double or quadruple spiral pattern I sort of vaguely noticed it in the back of my mind but I was so busy doing other things I never really thought it would be a problem but it is a problem when you need a good surface finish on a metal face and, it, and you can feel it with your fingernails as an actual corrugation in the part I don't want to get into it too deeply in this video because I'm supposed to be concentrating on rapid turn accuracy um, but at first I thought the problem was perhaps the spindle bearings you know maybe the uh, spindle bearing fit the inner race to the or the outer race to the housing or the spindle was loose and it was rattling around or the spindle bearing adjustment was out but the more I thought about it the more I thought no that wouldn't give a nice even pattern like that the only way you could get an even pattern like that is if the feed rate and the uh, RPM was coordinated to give a pattern like that. And the only way, that wouldn't happen from a random uh, spindle bearing or bearing race rattle or run out. Um, and I've checked the tool mounting and it's extremely rigid and steady. You know, there's, there's nothing there that's going to flex in a way that would cause that pattern either so all you've really got left is a, um, a strange feed rate caused by the software encoder um, circuit spindle turning in a milling machine is a lot more accurate than with rapid turn because you don't have to account for thermal expansion in the same way um, because the feed's coming in on the X and the uh, vertical spindle of the mill is uh, free to expand or contract without affecting the relative position between the tool and the part because the headstock is not located against the base in the X it's located against the base in the Y. In addition to that it's cast iron and that it has much less thermal expansion. So there's two reasons why thermal expansion is less of an issue with vertical spindle turning than it is on rapid turn. Okay so I've already talked about how that run of nearly 40 parts on rapid turn was not as inaccurate as I thought it might be. These theoretical tests showed thermal expansion could be as much as three or four hundredths of a millimeters on the radius, but the practical test showed that the thermal expansion issues was plus or minus half a thou. You know, I could machine parts to within a thou, to within two or three hundredths. Not high precision turning accuracy, but all right for general purpose workshop work. So I was trying to understand why it was so much better than I had anticipated 
and there was some really good comments posted with that number 20 part 20 YouTube video that were really helpful and I did a bit of study and a bit of thinking and I'll try and summarize some of that uh, information now I'm doing this series of clips while I'm running the parts in the vertical spindle turning mode in the other room so it's a bit hopefully won't be too just disjointed um, but I want to try and summarize some of the thoughts here um, why we got a lot less distortion a lot less thermal expansion issues there's several reasons for that and one of them is that it depends on the part and the amount of time that the spindle is running at high revs and the cycle of the part, let's say the cycle of the part is three minutes and it's only running at high revs for one minute and then there's a change over time of, of one minute where the spindle's cooling down and so the average RPM over the cycle time period uh, might only be um, quite a lot less than running at 2000 RPM for 15 minutes as we found in the theoretical tests that had quite a big impact on heating. So partly it's to do with the particular component you're machining and the cycle time. Okay, why don't I try and show graphically the difference between our theoretical test in part 20 and the actual test when I did the production run. So here's a graph. This is temperature in this direction, plus here. And this is time. 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes. Okay, so we're going to run the part at 2000 RPM. Um, and this is the theoretical test, part 20 test. So we switch it on, and the temperature climbs steadily and plateaus out, maybe at about 30 minutes, with a growth of about four hundredths of a millimeter in the spindle height on that particular RPM situation. So you can see there's a steady increase in temperature here to a plateau at about this point where the heat generated is sort of equal to the heat dissipation rate um, but the actual part cycle time I'm just checking that you can see me okay come down to this drawing this is the part cycle time and let's say the parts a cycle time of three minutes and then here's the next one and this is the actual time the parts rotating at low RPM it's going up to high RPM just for uh, 20 seconds or something and coming back down another little blip there and coming back down so the average RPM is right down low it's right down here somewhere and then there's a big gap here and here when you're changing the part over before the next part so if the part cycle time is say three minutes the heat generation over that three minutes may only be 30% of the long-term theoretical test that we did in the last video. So that I, I think is what explains the difference between the theoretical tests and the practical real world tests is that the heat generating period and the cool down period between part changes has a big effect. It may be more of an issue if you are turning very small diameter parts. If, if you're using the 5C collets and you're in the high speed range, and what's that goes up to 3,500 RPM, and you're turning small diameter parts um, that were very critical, small diameter steel parts, say, or aluminium parts where the, it was running for um, you know maybe several minutes per part uh, and you were making multiple parts then the headstock temperature would start to gain significantly and you'd get quite a bit of uh, thermal expansion issues but on a job like this it has quite a minor impact Okay, the next part's in and out there. So, okay, let's just look at what's going on here. So I've drawn an end view of rapid turn, of the headstock of rapid turn, all right? This is it here. Here's the center line. 
here's the spindle and spindle bearings. Here's the base plate mounted on the table. Now, when it's running at high revs, there's a lot of heat being generated by the bearings, by the grease churning in the bearings, by the friction of the bearings. And that heat is radiating outwards. Now, aluminium has quite a high heat transfer rate, quite a high conductivity. And the heat's going out in all directions. Now it doesn't matter if this becomes plus here and here and here because it's not reacting against anything. If the size of the headstock grows, it doesn't really matter. What does matter is when it reacts in this direction, downwards, that causes the spindle to rise up relative to the base of the machine. This is the base of the machine here. So we get a plus here. So that's what the issue is, the expansion of the material on the underneath reacting between the heated up spindle bearings and the base of rapid turn. A lot more to it than just that. It's not just the growth of the aluminium headstock here. There's also, well, what is the particular part you're making and what is the amount of the cycle time where it's running at high revs and how much of the time is it cooling down and what is the net effect of that how much is it stabilizing you might find the actual increase in this area here is only a few degrees on average and a small amount of thermal expansion and that may be also due to a couple of other factors that I haven't touched on yet but they've been mentioned um, in some of the comments under part 20 by uh, the posters some very good points the thermal conductivity of aluminium the heat dissipation rate if you like is quite high so if the heat transfer or the thermal conductivity from this hot spot to the cold base plate which is like a heat sink is fairly rapid and the heat's been drawn away from it almost as fast as it's being produced, then having a high coefficient of linear expansion is somewhat negated by the fact that the heat is dissipating rapidly also. So it might be expanding in a theoretical test, but in a practical test, the heat is dissipating away, especially when the spindle's not turning in between changing parts over, the heat's dissipating away and the whole thing's cooling back down and so the actual net effect of thermal expansion is much less. And that's what we found with these practical tests. The net effect on this particular part was plus or minus a hundredth of a millimeter, not plus or minus three or four hundredths of a millimeter. Well this problem isn't unique to rapid turn. Um, if you look at some of the comments posted under part 20, one chap um, had a, 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 an even worse issue with a $60,000 Haar slave where he had a lot of problem trying to control diameter accuracy due to thermal expansion over the course of the production run. And um, in some ways cast iron is worse than aluminium because although the coefficient of linear expansion is less than half, the thermal conductivity is very poor compared with aluminium and you can get a um, much less heat transfer uh, evacuating the heat out of that area and, and a greater build up if you like in this area as the cast iron holds the heat for longer and although the linear expansion rate is less the actual storage of heat relative to aluminium and the transfer out is much slower so the net effect of aluminium versus cast iron is not a simple equation. It's very much geometry dependent, cycle time dependent, heat source dependent and a whole lot of other variables that um, I'm only beginning to understand. But I wouldn't draw the simple conclusion that aluminium is bad and cast iron is good any longer. It's a little bit more involved in that. But this is very much part geometry and part size dependent. I mean, if you're turning a small diameter part, 
been using tungsten carbide tooling and averaging 3000 RPM for 10 minutes per part then it could work against you. The net effect could be more than the theoretical tests. You could end up with really serious um, linear expansion in this area and, and, and in, in the end it would not be negated uh, by the chilling effect of the thermal conductivity of the aluminium because it would just be running continually for long periods at that high RPM and if you're making a hundred parts with a 10 minute cycle time at high RPM then you'd have really serious accuracy difficulties. And then we have the question of we could have the tool coming in from the side or we can have the tool coming in from the top. Well the tool comes in from the top with rapid turn because that's the way the conversational is set up um, and the way the XYZ is set up. Um, whereas with spindle turning you can easily, uh, vertical spindle turning as I'm currently doing, you can have the tool coming in from the side. So the thermal expansion of where the headstock is mounted to the base of the machine, which is through this area, doesn't affect it very much if the tool's coming in from the side. So um, that's another big factor. It's not really ideal to have the tool coming down in the worst possible place with thermal expansion to react to it. But with rapid turn there's not a lot you can do about that because the convenience of the software means you really want to have your tool on the top. And okay, you could have a finishing cut mounted on the side with a special finishing tool, but that would be a lot more complicated to set up. You need gang tooling and um, you'd need to spend more time on the setup. It would only be worth it if you had a large production run of high precision parts. Well, just talking about um, vertical spindle turning versus rapid turn, I know it looks a bit grim. I'm running my parts now in vertical spindle turning and rapid turn sitting there idle. But I think that there are applications where vertical spindle turning is better than rapid turn and applications where rapid turn is better than vertical spindle turning. Vertical spindle turning on a Tormac 1100 has more power. It's a much pow more powerful motor. We have less thermal issues because um, we've got the tool in this orientation. We can get a better finish because whatever that issue is I'm having on rapid turn, it doesn't exist on vertical spindle turning. So they're all clear advantages in using vertical spindle turning. But rapid turn has some advantages too. It's got very convenient conversational programming. It's got the ability to use a tailstock. It has an encoder on the spindle and allows you to do threading and screw cutting. So um, it's horses for courses really. Uh, some jobs are clearly better on a spindle turning situation, other jobs are clearly better on rapid turn. I'm doing precision production runs of turned parts with rapid turn is obviously something that's fairly new to me and I guess a lot of you people that are watching these videos, this is all new country we're breaking in here, um, but there's bound to be one or two experienced CNC lathe people out there um, that are familiar with precision production turning of production runs of parts and the effects of thermal expansion and ambient temperature and um, tool wear and all the variables that go into getting consistently accurate production from CNC turning. So please post um, to the uh, video. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on it. Um, if you come from a background of manual turning, this is all new country and very interesting and a, and a steep learning curve. Alright guys, that was pretty long-winded, a lot of stuff to cover there. I couldn't see any way of doing it justice without covering a lot of that subject matter. So uh, thanks for your patience and uh, thanks for watching. Cheers.